Walks. Time for what? Experience in college. Time for reinforcement. Time for liftoff. Where nothing is impossible unless you think it is impossible. It's impossible. College, college. It's impossible. my college scholarship. Yes. Well, college ran by real fast. You hung in with the best college. Touchdown! First time for everything. Well, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Let's do this thing. Genius. Let's do this thing. Welcome to the show, everyone. We are so fortunate to have the one and only Coach Bluford. Um, he has been a, a college athletic advisor, a P instructor at St. Ignatius in San Francisco. He, during high school, was a multi-sport athlete and also played football at the infamous UC Santa Barbara. And one of the things I love the most about him, not only is his great hugs, but also he is a San Francisco native. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. You did your homework. I like it. Thank you. <laughs> I, I have to I have to do my homework, you know, for the celebrities I bring on to the show. Um, you know, you are infamous. Wasn't there a book? Weren't you mentioned in a book as well? Yes, I was actually mentioned in, in a couple of books. Yes. In a couple of books. You want to give them a shout out? Uh, yes, there was uh, a book written by one of our former faculty members, um, he didn't use my name specifically, but there was a reference to uh, Coach Red in, in his book. Um, I think it was called Shadow Lessons, uh, Mr. Reardon wrote. And then most recently, um, there was a book written about um, some teens in the San Francisco Bay Area, and they really highlighted St. Ignatius football. Um, and that was, uh, I want to say, four or five years ago. So I've been, I've been lucky and, and blessed at the same time. Yeah, because you have over 20 years of experience working with teenagers. Um, you have a long history um, coaching students. And now you're starting to be infamous as a college athletic advisor because you've done webinars at Revolution Prep, um, Compass Prep as well. And I've seen your work at presentations at NACAC um, as well. Am I missing anywhere else? Uh, no, I think you got it. There are a few with um, our WACAC SLCs, but other than that, um, I, I think you got it covered, yes. Yeah, so thank you for being part of this show and having our wonderful audience learn about college and sports and recruitment. So since that is a mouthful right there, can you tell me what is your approach? approach and philosophy if I'm a student or a parent of a high school student walking in your door saying, hey, I love sports. I think I'm good. I want to play in college. What's your philosophy when you approach students? Um, I really try to figure out what their level of desire really is. Um, a lot of students and their families and sometimes more families than the actual student, but I try to get a pulse on a, who really wants to do this, and how badly do they want to do it? Um, if there's a strong desire to go anywhere in the country to go participate and pursue your passion of sports, then there's opportunities out there. Um, but you got to really kind of got to figure out what those values are, what it means to you, who's driving it, and um, and know that there aren't any shortcuts in the process. Oh, I appreciate that. There are no shortcuts in the process. And yeah, um, a lot of times, even college coaches are like, wait, who's contacting me? The student or the parent? Because the student's playing. That's who I'm working with, right? You know, that, that starts um, day one. Now, a lot of times, students are very unclear because there's so much pressure from neighbors, parents, Etc. When should the recruitment process begin? If, if I'm playing sports, when should I start checking out college and their rosters for these different athletic teams? One of the things that I will tell our students um, is that you know the sooner that you're able to begin this process, the better. Now that will depend on gender and sport. There are some sports that are the, the college recruitment starts really early, and you'll find that in clubs like soccer and in volleyball, in softball even, where they've made specific rules even to delay the, the onset of recruiting for those sports because, you know, it got really out of hand and coaches were trying to get in too soon. 
So, but in general, a good launch point is in high school, sophomore year, probably spring of sophomore year would be the ideal time, especially if that sophomore is playing on the varsity and getting really, really good quality time. Um, if there's a freshman out there that's playing sports, playing on a varsity level and getting really, really substantial time and minutes at critical periods, then, yeah, that might be a thermostat for you. But in general, the sooner the better. It will depend on sport. But like I said, uh, the sooner that you get started with it, the better. No, I think that's really important because I also think that freshman year, your body's still changing regardless of what your gender is, right? And also playing from the middle school, playing at club, playing at high school is very different out yep. there. So that's some really sound advice. Now, I was one of those high school athletes that started later. So what if I'm, uh, I'm later on and all of a sudden I'm on the varsity team? Does that mean there's no hope if I start, let's say, a spring sport my junior year or even a fall sport my varsity year my senior, during senior year? You know, the, the, here's, the optimism is there are more than 1,600 colleges in the country. So um, things that will influence your acceptance to those colleges, I mean, I would clearly defer to you, but we know the GPA and test scores are going to influence that. And obviously your, your network and your ability to scholarship outside of the area of sports. Um, but for those kids who are starting sport late in the junior year, early senior year, there is a place. Again, the question is how, how strong is that desire and to know that there really aren't any shortcuts. Will you be at the top of recruiting list starting late junior year and beginning of senior year? Yes, you will be in, in that late category, but it does not mean that there aren't any options out there because there is a trickle-down effect and there are opportunities. Again, there's, there's 1,600 colleges depending on the sport that you're interested in. No, and I love that you point that out because a lot of times um, students, whether you're a sophomore or a senior, will focus on one or two colleges. And one thing I've heard over and over from the NCAA and other organization is have a big fishnet out there, right? Uh, right, yeah. right. Can you explain why I should narrow my choices Um and, and and this is saying that they haven't chose you yet, meaning no one has contacted you, no one asked you to fly in. Why should I have such a big net of colleges in the beginning of this recruitment process? Yeah, I, we, we and we, we would certainly suggest that for anyone at any level, whether it's at our school, um, at any high school in the country, and, and, and student athletes just getting interested in sports. Um, the bigger the net in the beginning, the better, because it, it increases the possibilities of being recruited. It also exposes those student athletes to different formats and approach that colleges will use to recruit student athletes. Yes, you have to have talent. Yes, you have to have GPAs and test scores that match the academic institutions. But you, the more of those you have in your, in your, in your hand or the opportunities to the better, because not everything shakes out as does for those kids that we see most of the time in the ESPN Top 100, right, or the ESPN Top 300. Most students are not in that category, so they want more options, and that's the name of the game, whether it's in athletics or on the academic side. You want to have more options, so that way you can be a bit more deliberate about selecting the best fit for the student athlete, for um, with a level of competition as well as academic interest. So, isn't it true that only about ten percent of students nationwide actually get recruited from a college? It's actually lower than that. Yeah. So it's yeah. lower than that, and I know only one percent actually play professionally who yeah, do play so in college. Yeah, you're looking at about two percent of each class will right. get will get Division One scholarships. Got it. Um, and two, you know, that, that percentage grows. And then, you know, we can talk about Division three opportunities a little bit later. But, again, you, you want to have more options so that way you are in, A, you're in the driver's seat and you're only in the process of recruiting. And it's not waiting for one person to, to tell you or you feeling like, oh, I've been, oh, I'm, I'm lucky enough to go. You want to drive the process as best you can. So creating more options early would do that. 
Now, you mentioned about division. So for some people just starting this process, can you um, explain to our audience what is NCA and the difference between Division One, Two, and Three? There's also yeah. this NAIA club and varsity sports. What's the difference between all those things? And what, uh, which one should I look at and which one should I not look at? Good question. Um, there are one NCAA. There's the NCAA. There is the NAIA, there's the NJCCA, um, and there are post-grad opportunities. So there's about four or five options for students who are interested in pursuing college sports. The NCAA has the largest number of schools and is the one that has the most exposure. And the ones that we really see on television are the top five, the best and the biggest conferences in the United States because they're, they're well-funded they get the most highlights, and they get some really, really elite athletics. Yeah, um, no, if so, you've anyone looked at their NCAA map, oh, my God, they're all over the place. <laughs> so. Yeah, and depend on sport, right, you'll find about 350 colleges that are Division One at the Division One level. Um, then there is the Division Two level, um, and at that level, you'll see a mix of academic and athletic strength. Good athletics at the Division Two level but when you're looking at specifically athletic scholarship opportunities, they're about half of what it would be at the Division One level per sport. So while in football you can have a roster of 85 um, scholarships, you're going to get about 36 full scholarships at the Division Two level. So there's just not as many. Right. So there is some money involved with Division One or Two, and there's also it, it varies how much because it depends on your playing time. Correct. Well, it depends. It depends on the sport. Yes, it depends on the sport. So there are a couple of what they call full ride sports at the Division One level, where every you know the each student gets a full amount of scholarship money as allotted to them um, based on the sport. So there's two of those for for men's sports at the Division One level, and then there are four sports on the women's side that offer that full ride and full ride. What a lot of people don't understand is full ride is what's the, the equivalent of the full tuition room and board of that particular institution. You know, so um, scholarship money at those levels could be anywhere between twelve and fifteen thousand um, dollars. At the Division Two level, there isn't as much. Again, because there there isn't that level of prestige, and nor is that level of funding at the Division Two level. At the Division Three level of the NCAA, they don't award athletic scholarships. However, they are in a position to create packages of financial support for families who they are interested in that play sport. And who needs um, that money? They have to demonstrate that need. They don't have like they can't give scholarship. I mean, money to a kid in Division Three if they have three houses in Tahoe, right? Right, right. That's true. And But what they will do is they will figure out a package for them with this understanding, the understanding that we find that this particular student athlete will bring value to our school in this said area. And so we're going to create some academic or some, some merit or talent opportunities that will give this particular student a break in their tuition as long as they uh, participate at our school in this area. So there are some opportunities like that at the Division Three level for student athletes. And then, again, you're looking at, and that average award, believe it or not, is greater than it is at the Division One level. But that you also find that at the Division Three level, those colleges are ten to $20,000 more expensive. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. Yeah, and then also I think all these different schools, uh, the level of competition is also different, like how much traveling time. A Division One school, you're traveling across the country. Um, in some NAIA schools or Division Three, definitely, uh, you know, varsity sports, you're competing more regionally. So that makes a big impact academically, correct? Absolutely. And it's, yeah, so it, it makes a big impact in two places. Certainly on the academic side, because, you know, you, you, you look at your travel time, and what that means for the students who have to miss classes and how quickly they can get back to classes. Um, and then, obviously, on the athletic side, you know, having the budget to pack a team 
to travel wherever they need to travel for that competition. So, you know, 